Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the American Prestige interview. I'm Danny Bessner, here as always with my friend and colleague Derek Davison, and we're very happy to be joined by the man with the coolest name in history, Sean Fear. And Sean is a lecturer in international history at the University uh, of Leeds, all the way over in the United Kingdom. So thanks so much for joining us, Sean. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's uh, really a thrill to be here and uh, and delighted to chat with you both, both of you guys. I always feel like a, a bit of an imposter when you set me up like that. Uh, you know, I should be <laughs> fighting crime or something, but um, I, I spend a lot of time in dusty archives, I'm afraid. Although I, Sean has no fear, more like. Um, <laughs> I, I so, will admit, I do still chuckle uh, when my students call me Doctor Fear, even though it's uh, <laughs> it's been long enough that I probably shouldn't. That's a, you know, it's a you good. Go on, if you go on long enough, you could get to the point where there's like an annual fear lecture, things like that. The, <laughs> the fear <laughs> conference. I mean, the, these the, the the horizons are limitless here. The yeah, fear the, endowment, the fear chair in history. The fear chair, exactly. <laughs> The fearsome school. And please do uh, get in touch if you'd like to be involved in funding the fear chair. At <laughs> yeah, we're, we're always looking for money here at American <laughs> Prestige. Uh, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is, I think, in, uh, an issue that's interesting for leftists and non-leftists alike. And, and that relates to what was South Vietnam? What was this state that, you know, has often been criticized by the left of the political spectrum, the anti-imperialist state, uh, the, sorry, the anti-imperialist uh, side of politics? As, as essentially a puppet state. But before we do that, why don't we give our listeners sort of a sense of what, what was going on in Vietnam? So Vietnam is often viewed from the American perspective, but one of the things that's happened in the last 20 years is that historians have begun to examine, you know, the Vietnam War from the perspective of the Vietnamese, and I imagine we'll be doing a lot here. So, Sean, it's 1945. World War II has ended. Japan, which had uh, invaded and occupied Vietnam, has been pushed out, and the French have retaken uh, Indochina. So what is the status of Vietnam in 1945, right at the end of World War II? Yeah, that's a, a great question, Danny. Thank you. Uh, 1945, I think, is a good place to start. Um, but I'm going to do that thing historians always do and uh, go back in time and talk about how complicated it is with some justification, I think, when it comes to 1945. In fact, uh, one very good early historian of Vietnam has written an entire book about this year alone. Um, so you're really jumping in at a, an opportune moment. Essentially, in 1945, uh, the French colonial state has been smashed by the Japanese occupying forces. Uh, J Imperial Japan occupied Vietnam uh, and really all of French Indochina during the Second World War. Uh, and as the Vichy regime in Europe breaks down, Japan takes the initiative and uh, sweeps aside the, the remnants of the French colonial state. But it's not long after that uh, the Japanese imperial project itself begins to collapse. And so there's really a power vacuum in Vietnam that emerges in 1945. The anti-French slogans of the enemy's national party still remain across many streets now guarded by both Allied and Japanese troops. It's also, I think, critical to note, this tends to get overlooked, but it's really important to understanding what happens during this year, uh, is widespread famine in Vietnam. Uh, this is partly because uh, the Japanese military has been extracting resources from Vietnam. It's also because uh, American bombing begins to take hold, food transportation networks break down. Um, probably at least a million people die as a result of the famine. So in the countryside, in particular in Vietnam, it's a really desperate time. Uh, the power vacuum allows uh, Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese communists uh, to uh, really capitalize on the opportunity and sweep to uh, some sort of claim on power, although this is really still contested in 1945. And I'll also just add that very few people in Vietnam uh, actually even know who Ho Chi Minh is at this point. Uh, he'd spent much of his time in exile in various parts of the world, uh, a, a quite a long career uh, building uh, overseas Vietnamese revolutionary networks in southern China, uh, later in Thailand. But he's really not well known in Vietnam at this point. And I think that gives a sense of 
uh, just how up for grabs everything really is in 1945, uh, which is why it's a, a good place to start things off. Sean, I actually have a question because my understanding is is that even in 2021, we don't know the full biography of Ho. Um, maybe I'm incorrect and you could correct me about that, but could you give you know a few minutes on who was this world historical figure? Where did he come from? How did he become a communist? What does this say about international communism in the first half of the 20th century? Because I think that's crucial to understanding the history of, of Vietnam. Yeah, and another really good question. And um, we certainly, I think, know more about him now than we did several decades ago. There are a number of good biographies about Ho Chi Minh, um, but he's a, a man on the move. So it, it is difficult to, in some uh, instances, pin him down with any real certainty. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was born in central Vietnam in 1890. Uh, under the name Nguyen Sinh Kum, uh, Ho Chi Minh is just one of many different aliases that he has, which is another reason why it's sort of tricky to track him down. Um, he is uh, the son of uh, a former official in the Vietnamese imperial system. Uh, we can talk about that if you like, but he comes from a, a reasonably um, well-established pedigree in Vietnam at that time. Um, he uh, goes off to university in the city of Hue in central Vietnam and becomes somewhat radicalized uh, by a widespread uh, rural demonstration that takes place against French colonialism in 1908. So he's, it's not the reading that makes him radicalized. He like, sees this anti-colonial movement when he's in Hue, and he's like, oh, this seems to make sense, even though my father is an official of the imperial state. Yeah, it's a, a combination of both, I suppose. Um, but I think seeing— Like, is he uh, reading Marx? That's what I'm asking. Is he, like, reading Marx? Is he reading Engels? Is he reading Lenin? Like, what what is what is he reading? Well, that that all comes later. Uh, okay, cool. Ho Chi, so Ho Chi Minh, this uh, moment, I think, in 1908 is an early formative memory. Uh, but he leaves Vietnam shortly after that in 1911— uh, not to return, really, uh, for about 30 years. He joins a steamship line, uh, travels to the United States, where he spends time in Boston, uh, working at a hotel. Uh, he spends a bit of time in West London, uh, and then he makes his way to France. And I think it's really in France where he uh, meets up with other uh, Vietnamese expatriates who are in France at the time, where he starts to think uh, in a much more serious way about politics. That uh, I think almost certainly is when he starts to encounter Marx. Um, but he he is widely read. Uh, he speaks many languages, uh, Chinese, uh, a, a bit of Thai, Russian. Um, he's quite a worldly figure. And it's really during his time in France. In So this is during World War I or just after World War I? Well, during and, and just after World War I. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm okay. trying to be precise about the dates. Uh, but No, no, of course. We, we, we know very well that Ho Chi Minh is in France uh, by the end of World War I, where he's kind of hanging out, uh, meeting up with Vietnamese expatriates who are there as well. And that's really when I think his uh, attraction to Marx and Lenin in particular uh, starts to take hold. Um, Ho Chi Minh at this point had some uh, hope that the French colonial system could be reformed. Um, that there would be spaces for someone like him and, uh, and like-minded Vietnamese nationalists to operate within the, fr uh, the confines of the French colonial system. Um, but he's increasingly drawn to uh, more radical critiques of colonialism. And I think Lenin in particular is important because Lenin uh, is uh, able to make this connection quite clearly. He defines imperialism as a, a kind of final form of capitalism. And that is quite a compelling critique for people uh, like Ho and others of his generation. So this is the moment that the historian Eros Manella famously refers to as the Wilsonian moment. And my understanding is that um, Ho actually petitions Woodrow Wilson during the, you know, um, the, the, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919. Is that correct or is that a myth? And if so, what's going on there? What does Ho think that he could get from Wilson and what does Wilson's rejection mean for Ho? Well, yeah, that's um, a good point as well. I do think there uh, are strong grounds for seeing this time period as a Wilsonian moment. Um, 
intellectuals like Ho Chi Minh in Egypt, uh, in India, in, uh, in Korea, and, and many other parts of the world are drawn to Wilson. But there has long been a temptation to regard this moment uh, in the, the scholarship of the Vietnam War as a, a kind of lost opportunity. More recently, though, I think uh, historians of Vietnam are a bit skeptical about this. Um, I, I don't want to name drop here, and forgive me, uh, anyone who is a Vietnam historian, if I if I don't mention you, um, but I will single out one piece because it's quite short and worth reading if you're interested in more detail on this uh, by a, a historian, Brett Riley, writing for the Wilson Center. Uh, Riley, I think, makes a fairly compelling case that Ho Chi Minh has already move past uh, Wilsonianism at this point, that he's already looking much more uh, to what's happening in the Soviet Union and to um, socialist and later communist movements in France. And indeed, uh, Ho Chi Minh is one of the founding members of the French Communist Party when they break uh, with the socialists in 1920. So the, uh, the idea that this represents a, a kind of lost cause is something that more recent historians of Vietnam are, are skeptical about. Um, but I do think that Wilson's broader failure to deliver on the promise of Wilsonianism, uh, not just with regard to Vietnam, uh, but elsewhere in the world, um, is a, a kind of blow for American prestige in the developing world. That's American prestige, the concept, not American prestige, the podcast. Yes, the, the podcast. <laughs> that will last not forever. Not for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. no, only, only greater things for the podcast. We'll be around in 5,000 years. Uh, Sean, could you maybe just delineate that, you know, the difference between the Wilsonian promise and the difference between the Leninist promise and where someone like Ho, uh, why he would be more attracted to the Leninist promise at this moment and, you know, post-World War I, but the empires remain? Yeah, um, well... The idea of national self-determination, uh, arguably not originally proposed by Wilson, but certainly a concept associated with Wilson, um, something that he envisions as uh, framing a post-war settlement in Europe, is extremely appealing to uh intellectuals in uh, countries that are colonized by the European powers. So again, Korea, uh, China, India, um, Vietnam, um, all over the world, this idea of national self-determination resonates. But uh, Wilson himself is quite reluctant to see this applied beyond Europe. Um, Wilson, um, I, I think it's quite fair to say, was a white supremacist. He really did hold uh, a kind of deep racial ideology. And in any case, his hands were really tied by the European powers. Um, so the idea that Wilson represented, I suppose, more than actually personally sought to deliver, uh, the idea that Wilson represented national self-determination um, did not come to fruition. And as a result, Lenin's critique of imperialism uh, framing imperialism as a kind of inevitable outgrowth of capitalism uh, begins to resonate with people like Ho Chi Minh. So it's, uh, it offers a, a kind of much more persuasive explanation of how a place like Vietnam found itself uh, under French colonial rule. And it, it seems to offer a much more concrete way of addressing that as well. Sean, as we um, move into discussing the partition and talking about South Vietnam. I, I'm, I'm curious, and I, I guess I want to take us, you, you started, you know, taking us back further, you know, but before 1945, um, I'm curious about the nature of French Indochina and that, that region, um, in comparison with, um, let's say the partition of Korea, which was done wholly as a sort of imperial zone of influence, uh, imposed from outside. There's no, that, that partition made no cultural or, or, um, you know, sense on the ground. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about whether it, it's, um, that's the same thing with, in terms of the, the North South Vietnamese split, or if there was some, um, you know, deeper in the past, kind of, if there was some sense that you can make of that, that division. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, another really important question. So, during the French colonial period, the French colonial authorities are at pains never to refer to Vietnam as a unified territory. They always insist on uh, formal division between three regions, uh, roughly 
North, Central, and South Vietnam, uh, or as they uh, call it, refer to them, Tonkin, uh, Annam, and Cochinchin. So the idea of a unified Vietnam is threatening to the colonial authorities, and it's a kind of rallying cry for emerging Vietnamese nationalists during that time period. But that said, um, there really is a basis for cultural distinctions between the North and, and South in Vietnam. Um, there have been recurring war, I, I won't go into too much detail here, but recurring wars between political entities in the North of Vietnam and the South of Vietnam, uh, going back at least 400 years. Um, even if you go to Vietnam now, you'll notice some cultural differences. The, there are linguistic differences between the two regions. Uh, Central Vietnam is, is kind of ambiguous in its own right, situated between the North and the South. Um, so I don't think the division is quite as uh, artificial as a lot of the early people who wrote about the Vietnam War in English assumed. And during the time period that I focus on uh, more specifically in my research, um, South Vietnam after about 1963, uh, regional tensions are a serious problem for the South Vietnamese state. After 1954, uh, probably on the order of 800,000, 900,000, maybe even a million people leave the North to the South. Uh, and on one hand, it's a kind of public relations boost for the Southern government, but it creates real administrative headaches for them because native Southerners um, are often not particularly welcoming to the Northerners. Um, there are real divisions between Northern and Southern factions within the South Vietnamese state. Um, these tensions are real, and uh, I, I think that um, sweeping them aside, I suppose, uh, presenting them as artificial, uh, as a critique of the United States intervention in Vietnam, uh, overlooks the, the much more complex and I think richer history of Vietnam that's really essential to understanding why the South Vietnamese state ultimately collapses. So that's really interesting. So what we have, just to reiterate for listeners, is that even before the partition of the state in 1954, um, there are cultural divisions. So before we get to sort of the partition, just why don't you ta uh, briefly take us, what is Ho doing in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s? Not, we don't need every detail, but what is, you know, this basic shift? So he decides with, he, he sides with Lenin and international communism, but you mentioned something interesting and think this is crucial to Vietnam is that he's also a nationalist. So how does sort of these nationalist politics of the post-World War I period interact with international communism as international communism, of course, and ironically, becomes situated in the national state of the Soviet Union? Yeah. And if I may, I think that question is touching on a debate that really preoccupied early English language historians of the Vietnam War. Uh, was Ho Chi Minh a true uh, nationalist? Was he a committed right. communist? Um, and the reason why that seems so significant is that to the anti-war movement, uh, presenting Ho Chi Minh as first and foremost a nationalist uh, diminished the Cold War implications of the Vietnam War. On the other hand, uh, proponents of American intervention in Vietnam were eager to portray Ho as uh, a committed communist, um, somebody who believed in global revolution rather than strictly Vietnamese independence. I think, though, that to really get to the bottom of this question, uh, we need to look at the emergence of Vietnamese nationalism in the first place, because the early resistance to French colonial rule in Vietnam in the late 19th century is not quite nationalist. Uh, many of those who take up arms against the French do so out of loyalty to the Vietnamese emperor. It's only really in the 1910s, the 1920s, and especially the 1930s um, that nationalism begins to gain currency, um, that the sense of belonging to a nation called Vietnam that demands liberation from the French begins to take hold. And communism is just one form that this nationalism takes. Uh, there are many other Vietnamese nationalists who are inspired by uh, Sun Yat-sen, uh, later Chiang Kai-shek in China, um, there's real competition, I suppose, uh, as to the political shape that uh, that this nationalist sentiment might take. Um, 
Ho Chi Minh, um, during this time period, the 1920s and the 1930s, is traveling all over the place. Uh, he spends a good deal of time in southern China, in Guangzhou, uh, later in Thailand. Uh, he's sort of in and out of Moscow. Is he traveling and, as an agent of any communist authority, or is he traveling as an individual learning about the world? It's a, a kind of fusion of the two, really. I think his earlier travels, he's really just a, a young man trying to find his way in the world. Um, increasingly, though, as he's drawn to communist politics uh, in Paris and then in Moscow, he's trying to bring a kind of Vietnamese communist force into being, uh, organizing overseas Vietnamese in southern China, in Thailand, really wherever he can find them. Uh, and these are young people who are often uh, forced to flee Vietnam by the French colonial police because they're involved in nationalist political activity. Ho Chi Minh is trying to organize them uh, and turn them into a coherent Vietnamese communist force that will be recognized uh, in, uh, in Moscow and then later when the time comes in Beijing. But he's not the only uh, Vietnamese communist who is doing this sort of thing. And in fact, uh, I mentioned earlier, he's really not even very well known in Vietnam uh, until 1945. There's also uh, a good deal of communist political activity taking place in Vietnam. So. Uh, we might call them domestic Vietnamese communist uh, movements come into being. There are Vietnamese Trotskyists, uh, bitter rivals of the Vietnamese Stalinists that Ho Chi Minh represents. Um, so it's, it's really sort of chaotic. There's all these different groups uh, drawn towards communism, but it's not until the 1940s uh, when they all come together under, uh, under Ho Chi Minh's banner. And it's not sort of preordained that that's going to happen either. Totally. So it's 1945. Um, the, the Vietnamese communists come under Ho Chi Minh's banner, as you just said. What is the strategy? And then maybe you could take us between 45 and 54. Yeah. So what, what is the strategy of Ho in 45? And then what happens between 45 and 54? Yeah. Well, I, I should just jump back quickly. I know it's an annoying thing that uh, no, that I love it. Do. I'm a historian. The I historian's think, um, joke is it, it happened earlier <laughs> and it was more complicated. That's yeah, a historian's yeah, critique you, you of know everything. The, <laughs> you know the cliche, and I'm sorry for your benefit, Danny, uh, for uh, for resorting to it here. Um, 1941 is the kind of pivotal year when Ho Chi Minh returns to Vietnam and starts trying to bridge the gap between overseas Vietnamese communist organizations uh, and the, the Vietnamese communist groups that have been slowly but surely developing in Vietnam this whole time. And essentially what he's trying to do is to build the strength of Vietnamese communism and uh, resist the Japanese occupation, which during this period is working closely with uh, the French colonial regime. During this time period, uh, we have to recall that France in Europe, uh, metropolitan France, is under the control of the Vichy government, so um, the, the government uh, formally affiliated with uh, the German Nazi regime. Um, and they are formal, I guess, sort of technical allies with the Japanese uh, imperial presence. So Ho Chi Minh is trying to organize people uh, in resistance uh, against the Japanese and by extension, the French colonial state. And the tactics at this point are quite preliminary. This is sort of real uh, low scale guerrilla operations, kind of hit and run raids. Um, one thing he does that's quite successful, especially in light of the 1945 famine, is to organize people to attack uh, Japanese grain silos and redistribute the food uh, to ordinary people in the countryside. This, I think, as much as anything, uh, helps Ho Chi Minh and, uh, and the Vietnamese communist movement to build its appeal. But at this point, um, the communist movement is still quite weak. It's working in... Uh, working under the auspices of an umbrella organization, uh, the Viet Minh. And I think anybody who's read anything about the Vietnam War uh, will be loosely familiar with the term the Viet Minh. This is uh, a kind of umbrella organization, really um, the creature of wartime expediency, uh, intended to provide a rallying point for different Vietnamese nationalist groups. Uh, communists certainly um, and there's real apprehension behind the scenes about just how much the communists control the Viet Minh. Um, but up until 1945, 1946, there are other uh, Vietnamese nationalist groups affiliated with the Viet Minh as well. Okay, two questions. One, why Ho? Uh, 
why of all the leaders is it Ho? Is he just such a charismatic guy? You know, is he a George Washington esque figure? He's, you know, like George Washington was famously taller than everyone, yeah. and Castro is, you know, charismatic. So why Ho? And then what happens with the French between forty five and fifty four, and particularly focusing on the Vietnamese? Like, how do they how do they win that? It's pretty crazy. Like, yeah. how do they win yeah. that? Yeah, um, these are all core questions in the historiography and people write books about this. So I'll, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll try to be succinct without um, leaving aside anything too important. I think the question of why Ho Chi Minh is a really intriguing one and, uh, and one that certainly needs to be spelled out in more detail. It's, as I said, not necessarily preordained that he will emerge uh, as the kind of first among equals of the various contenders for Vietnamese nationalism, but even within the Vietnamese Communist Party. I think one reason is that, as you know, he is charismatic and he uh, devotes a good deal of thought and energy to cultivating uh, a personality. Uh, so when he comes back to Vietnam, he's grown uh, a kind of long beard. He's a much older man, certainly, than when he left. Uh, and he tries to portray himself as a kind of genial, um, genial uh, avuncular figure, a kind of father figure to the Vietnamese nation. Now, this is really posturing uh, in the early 1940s, um, but it's a persona that serves him well and that, that will come to pay dividends. I think also the fact that he was so worldly, um, so well connected that he uh, had contacts in Moscow, he had contacts in uh, China with the Chinese communists, uh, made him an asset. And he's a, a kind of roving diplomat figure throughout the rest of the war. But one thing I really want to note, because um, I'm not sure we'll have time uh, to get into this much, is that Ho Chi Minh is by no means um, the clear authority in the Vietnamese Communist Party. He's always presented this way, uh, such that people still refer to him as the, the main decision maker on the Vietnamese Communist side. Um, but one thing that a lot of Vietnamese proficient historians have done is to um, look behind closed doors, so to speak, within the Vietnamese Communists. Actually, um, probably by the uh, mid-1950s, Ho Chi Minh is increasingly displaced uh, by another man named Les Wan, who is really the kind of driving figure uh, behind the North Vietnamese war effort in the 1960s. And Ho uh, has an important role to play as a kind of spiritual father, uh, somebody who has a great deal of prestige and credibility uh, internationally, but also domestically. Um, but he's not really calling the shots in Hanoi, uh, certainly not after the, the mid-1950s, I would say. Uh, okay, so Ho is leading the communists and the French, they don't want to leave Vietnam. How, how the hell do the French get forced to leave Vietnam? Okay, so one thing that I think is really critical to stress is that even at this point, even after um, helping to uh, contest the Japanese occupiers during the Second World War, even after helping to alleviate the famine and indeed uh, declaring Vietnam to be an independent state in 1945, uh, Ho Chi Minh does not speak for the entirety of the Vietnamese people. And I just don't think we can understand the war against France uh, without really uh, making a point of this. Uh, in the South in particular, uh, the Vietnamese communists launched an uprising in 1940, and it was uh, rather successfully suppressed by the French. So the Vietnamese communists um, under the Viet Minh umbrella are always far weaker in the south than they are uh, in the north and the center part of the country during this time period. Um, really beginning in 1945, and especially in 1946, uh, the Vietnamese communists moved to assert control uh, over the Viet Minh movement. And so a lot of the uh, Vietnamese nationalists, and I, I say nationalists here referring to a specific political party modeled after uh, Sun Yat-sen and the Guomindang in China, um, a lot of them are cast aside. A lot of them are killed uh, by the Vietnamese communists, frankly. So the, the kind of civil war for control of post-colonial Vietnam is already well underway. That said, um, Ho Chi Minh and, uh, and the Vietnamese communists are able uh, reasonably quickly to consolidate control in the northern part of the country in particular. Um, 
it gets quite complicated. And I, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but one thing that's really important is that um, after the defeat of Japan in 1945, um, Vietnam is provisionally partitioned at the Potsdam Conference. The southern part of Vietnam is occupied by uh, British forces until the French are strong enough to, uh, to recover and to, uh, uh, to take control again. And the northern part of the country is uh, controlled by the Chinese nationalists. So at Potsdam, uh, the Chinese nationalists are essentially granted uh, northern Vietnam to control until such time as the French are able to return. Yeah, reassert themselves reassert after the themselves. horrible defeat exactly. of the Blitzkrieg. Yeah, exactly. So Ho Chi Minh knows Ho Chi Minh and the, and the Vietnamese communists know that this sort of Chinese nationalist interregnum is a window of opportunity, a kind of race to build up their legitimacy in the countryside and uh, uh, and really bring into being the government that they've proclaimed. Um, actually, Ho Chi Minh is quite reluctant at this point to engage France in a full-scale war. Uh, and he spends the better part of 1946 trying to prevent this from happening. Um, you know, he's negotiating constantly with uh, French representatives to have Vietnam join uh, what was referred to as a, a French union. So Vietnam would, under this model, have de facto autonomy over its economic affairs, uh, but would be loyal to France in uh, defense policy and foreign affairs. Like a Commonwealth type situation, exactly. basically modeled exactly. on the British. Yeah, a like they would be the Canada of the French. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, Canada is a, a model. Canada and Australia is a model that Vietnamese nationalists who are more willing to work within the French system uh, suggest as a, a kind of proposal. Um, but this breaks down and I think the leading cause here is just that the French forces stationed in Vietnam are kind of hardcore revanchists. Um, they want no part of Ho Chi Minh. Um, they're kind of humiliated from defeat in Europe. They really want to assert French uh, sovereignty and control over Vietnam um, to kind of restore French uh, honor and, and prestige in light of the humiliations that France uh, felt itself to have suffered in Europe. And these local officials, these kind of local French military figures, really force Ho Chi Minh's hand. It's not actually until the end of 1946, though, uh, when the conflict formally breaks out. So there's almost a, a year-long interregnum. Essentially, the French forces demand the right to collect customs duties at a northern port, Haiphong. Uh, when the Vietnamese counterparts refuse, the French bomb the city of Haiphong. And that Jesus. is really a point of no return. Um, Ho Chi Minh is under real pressure from people within his own ranks who see him as too uh, willing to accommodate the French. Um, and that's really the, the kind of point of no return. And that is really what um, triggers the... Uh, the eight-year-long war that follows. Now, how does Ho Chi Minh, how do the Vietnamese communists win this war? Yeah, how do they win this war? This is the big question. Like, um, yeah. and, uh, because, and then they win the war against the Americans, of course. But so, like, what allows them to win the war with the French? Yeah, I think it makes sense to think about this war in stages. Uh, an early stage between late 1946 into 1949, uh, and then a second stage from 1949 until 1954. During the early stages of the conflict, as I said, um, the communists are quite weak in the South. They're sort of forced to uh, resort to hit and run tactics, uh, terrorism, frankly, bomb attacks, grenade attacks, uh, assassination campaigns. I'm not using the term in a, in a moral sense, but it's uh, essentially yeah. sporadic tactical violence to... Um, convince people that the French authorities are weak. But it's really only in the north where they're able to build a mass movement. Well, the situation in French Indochina grows graver as bitter fighting sweeps through Hanoi, leaving misery and destruction in its wake. And the war, to some extent, um, allows them to really accelerate this. They're able to portray themselves in a very convincing way as the true heirs of Vietnamese nationalism. Um, France attacked us, we need to fight for the nation. And they use the war as a pretext to mobilize Vietnamese society, um, primarily in the north and central Vietnam, uh, against the French. So they send cadres into the countryside, 
Um, they build up mass literacy programs. They uh, try to convince ordinary people in rural Vietnam that they can be revolutionary agents in this uh, calling uh, against the French. In the early years, um, they're really forced to resort to guerrilla tactics, you know, hit and run attacks, blowing up railways, um, attacking French platoons and in the north. Back now we're the talking about the north. Yeah. Yeah. So this is primarily in the north. And I do think that distinction will be important uh, in uh, in the years to come. Um, generally speaking, during this early period, although they fight quite tenaciously uh, for Hanoi before being forced to retreat, Generally speaking, when they encounter uh, French military forces, they come off uh, they come off badly. So it's much more about building a kind of mass movement and um, harassing French positions. What really changes is um, well a number of events that take place in 1949. First of all, uh, as you know, in 1949 the Chinese communists are victorious and they're able to consolidate control uh, over the full range of continental China, at least, uh, excluding Taiwan, of course. But this allows the Vietnamese communists to link up with the battle-hardened, uh, experienced Chinese communists. And it allows them to really use the northwest area of Vietnam uh, as a kind of base area. And they are eager to take on Chinese assistance. Um, so the Chinese communists provide the Vietnamese communists with uh, training, um, weapons, supplies, uniforms. Um, I just don't think it's plausible to imagine the Vietnamese communists being able to contest France uh, without this critical development that takes place in China. On the other hand, uh, 1949 has important political uh, implications uh, implications, sorry, in the United States. Um, 1949 is the year that the Soviet Union successfully tests an atomic bomb. Um, the political fallout of the, uh, as Americans at the time might put it, the loss of China to communist right. forces um, leads to the McCarthy era, to the Red Scare, to this kind of moment of uh, intense anti-communist uh, paranoia in the United States. And that really allows French colonial officials to position what they're doing uh, not as a kind of antiquated uh, bid at reviving colonialism, but as a, a, a much more urgent uh, Yeah, the uh, vanguard front. of anti-communism, essentially. The French begin to I, present themselves as the vanguard of international anti-communism, tricking the always uh, great-making decisions Americans to start supporting them. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. They're able to spin the Vietnam War as a Cold War struggle. And increasingly, even as the war starts to become less and less popular in France, um, the United States steps up to the plate. By the time uh, the war with France ends, the United States is uh, supplying on the order of 80% of the French war effort and really um, egging on the French. Um, Essentially, what happens is the Vietnamese communists are able to combine uh, incredibly successful mass mobilization with the assistance that they gain from uh, the Chinese communists. Uh, and they're able to take on the French and succeed in an extremely dramatic uh, showpiece battle. This is the, the, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, uh, which takes place in 1954. The lonely jungle outpost, surrounded by communist guerrillas and accessible only by air, is doomed. Really, at this point, both sides uh, are looking for an out to the conflict. Um, the war is unpopular in France. Uh, the French left is organizing against it. Dock workers are uh, striking to prevent material being sent to the front. Um, the Vietnamese communists are um, are reaching their limits as well, so it's it's kind of in both sides' interest to stage this dramatic uh, set piece battle before already scheduled negotiations between the great powers on Vietnam are set to begin. And it's really um, as much as anything else a story of mass mobilization. Um, the French choose to fortify a remote part of the country. They're hoping that they can finally use their uh, superior firepower to their advantage. Uh, and the Vietnamese accept the challenge. What they have and what the French don't initially know about is artillery. Uh, artillery coming from across the border from China. And it's just a Herculean effort to supply 
the Vietnamese troops, uh, the Viet I should say the, the Viet Minh forces um, to take part in this battle. We're talking about um, probably on the order of a million people, uh, many of whom are women, you know, just reflecting how mobilized society has become, hauling things through incredibly uh, inhospitable terrain, you know, down muddy paths, up and down mountains, through the jungle, um, carrying sacks of rice on wooden bicycles, um, dragging artillery through the woods. And eventually the Viet Minh forces get to the French position. And on the first day of battle, they open fire with their artillery. The French immediately know um, that they've bit off more than they can chew, that they, they have a real fight on their hands. Um, Sacre bleu. <laughs> yeah, slowly but surely, um, at great cost in terms of human casualties, the Viet Minh forces uh, advance and descend on the French position. And it's really a, a decisive moment in, um, in the history of anti-colonial struggle, uh, something that resonates far beyond the borders of Vietnam. 1949, uh, and, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 1949 is, is also the year when the French set up what I guess you could consider to be the precursor in some ways to the South Vietnam, uh, the, the state of Vietnam, which is supposed to be uh, the anti-communist alternative, I guess, to, to what's happening in the North. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that government and whether it had any like uh, whether it had any legitimacy um, or was it sort of purely a, a kind of imperial puppet government? Yeah, Derek, I'm, I'm so happy that you asked that because it's a really important question to consider. And I was already um, starting to anticipate uh, some of my Vietnamese historian critics uh, having a go at me for not uh, not bringing that up as well. Yes, yeah, so in 1949, um, partly in order to make uh, American support for the French war effort palatable in the United States, the French establish what is known as the State of Vietnam. Uh, and they offer a bit of a concession, although it turns out to mean much less than Vietnamese nationalists think it might. Um, they formally are willing to acknowledge that Vietnam is a single territorial unity. Um, so no longer do the French insist on dividing it into three constituent parts. Um, they recognize the full territorial extent of Vietnam as uh, a political entity and claim sovereignty or allow it to claim sovereignty over um, the, the full range of what we now call the country of Vietnam. The French choose as their leader a man named Bao Dai. Uh, and they have a long the history. The Baodai solution. Dai. The Baodai solution. Was exactly. Yes. Baodai was a member of the Vietnamese monarchy, um, the Vietnamese royal family, uh, which had to a certain extent been discredited uh, due to its close links with French colonial rule. But Baodai, I will argue, um, and I think others would agree with me, is a more interesting and complex figure. Um, than a lot of early English language scholarship on the war allows. Baodai um, is dealt a kind of terrible hand, really. He's sort of groomed from birth to be uh, this symbol of French colonialism in Vietnam. And on a number of occasions, he really refuses to play ball. In 1945, for example, when Ho Chi Minh proclaims the independence of Vietnam, Baodai abdicates. Um, he refuses to kind of stick up for the idea um, that the, the Vietnamese monarchy under French supervision represents uh, a, a legitimate claim on the territory. However, by the time we get to 1949, the situation has really changed. And Vietnamese nationalists who are not communists, and the, the critical thing to remember here is that there are many people in Vietnam uh, who are not communists. Um, that is not at all a, a Western creation. Um, by 1949, they're deeply ambivalent about what is happening in the North. Uh, members of the Vietnamese Nationalist Party uh, flee to a large extent. They flee for their lives. Uh, many of them are killed in this kind of internecine fighting that takes place in 1946. Um, Vietnamese Catholics are increasingly apprehensive about the uh, communist presence within the Viet Minh. So there are people who have good reason to be suspicious uh, of what's happening in the North. And they're willing to enter uh, what they all regard as a kind of compromised accommodation with France, 
in order to hopefully carve out a bit of space for themselves, uh, independent of what is looking like an increasingly uh, heavy-handed uh, control-oriented regime in the north. Um, this isn't formally partitioned into North and South Vietnam yet, but the, the communist real strength areas are in the North. Bao Dai is uh, nominally the head of this state, but when it becomes clear that France is really just using this as a pretext uh, to reassert colonial control and bring the United States in, um, Bao Dai basically gives up on this. Um, and again, he's dealt a kind of terrible hand. He, he really has no movement beyond the palace um, he does what he can to resist, which is basically to just give up on the whole thing. Um, he does these sort of subtle gestures toward Vietnamese nationalism, but he really refuses to, uh, to dignify the, the proceedings. He kind of retreats to his uh, estate and tries to do what he can to prevent the French from turning him into a legitimizing symbol of this regime. It's a, a kind of recurring pattern throughout Vietnamese history. Uh, Vietnamese nationalists who um, don't think that violent confrontation with France can succeed or who later on uh, have well-founded fears about their prospects under a communist system, uh, making these very compromised accommodations with the French regime. Um, and they're almost always let down by the French. Um, you know, I, I think there's a strong case to be made that if uh, the French colonial authorities had been more reform-minded if they'd been willing to uh, allow some of these Vietnamese figures more autonomy um, along the lines of what the British do in India, which is a, a kind of common uh, lament among the French nationalists. Um, the, the outcome that we're all familiar with could have been headed off then and there. And that's, um, I think, something that might... Uh, get me in a bit of trouble with uh, with American leftists, but I think the, the history bears this out. So Bao Dai doesn't work out like the French want him to. They lose the big 1954 battle. And so what's the political settlement that comes out of 1954? Who are the interested actors and what winds up happening and why? Yeah, 1954 is another real turning point in uh, in the long history of what becomes the Vietnam War. Um, already before the uh, decisive encounter at Dinh Binh Phu, uh, the great powers, so uh, France, Britain, the Soviet Union, uh, communist China, and to some extent the United States, um, agree that something needs to be done about the wars in Korea. Uh, the Korean War is also not quite concurrent, but a, still a concern at this point, uh, and Vietnam. And so they agree, even before this battle happens, um, that something needs to be done, that they'll all get together and have a big conference and, uh, and try to hammer out some sort of settlement. And this takes place in Geneva in Switzerland in the spring of 1954. As soon as this conference is announced, uh, the dynamic of the fighting changes. Both sides are kind of jockeying for a position at the bargaining table uh, as much as they are on the battlefield. And in fact, uh, Dien Bien Phu surrenders more or less on the eve of the conference. Um, so the, the Vietnamese communists, the Viet Minh, but really at this point, they're not fooling anyone. The, the Vietnamese communists uh, arrive with a lot of wind in their sails. That said, um, their communist allies in the Soviet Union and in China are reluctant to see the war going on much longer. Uh, in the Soviet Union, this is after the death of Stalin. Uh, his eventual successor, Nikita Khrushchev, at, at this moment is interested in peaceful coexistence with the West, in sort of uh, lowering the temperature, um, building a more uh, manageable relationship with the West. And in China as well. Uh, the Chinese communists have uh, sacrificed considerably uh, to the, the Korean War effort, um, to a lesser extent, but still decisive to the Vietnamese communists as well. Um, Mao's position within the Chinese communists is a bit weaker during this time period. Um, so there's a move on the part of the Chinese communists to rein things in too. And to be honest, the Vietnamese communists are not really in a position where they can keep things going much longer. So although um, they arrive triumphant, um, behind the scenes, they too acknowledge that some sort of negotiated settlement is inevitable, that they're just not going to be able to uh, press their advantage and uh, attempt anything like control of the South. 
So what essentially gets decided is that, uh, first of all, and I'm simplifying things here, so Vietnam experts, please forgive me. Uh, first of all, Laos and Cambodia become independent. They formally uh, leave uh, uh, French Indochina and their independence as sovereign states is recognized. Um, equally importantly and, uh, and extremely importantly for the conflict that is to follow, uh, the Vietnamese communists and France accept what is intended to be a temporary partition of Vietnam at the 17th parallel. Um, the Vietnamese communists, the, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, as they call themselves, is formally acknowledged north of the 17th parallel. Um, so in that sense, they win, uh, although it's not a complete victory. Uh, and France has nominal authority. The state of Vietnam uh, and France have, have kind of nominal authority uh, south of the 17th. It's a very complicated situation in the south, and, and maybe we can talk about that later. Um, finally, um, the great powers agree that one way to end this temporary provision will be for elections to take place in 1956, uh, nationwide elections to determine what the fate of a unified Vietnam will look like. But there's a, a key hitch in this plan. Uh, first and foremost, although the United States is present as an observer at the conference, it's not formally involved in the proceedings, uh, and it doesn't sign the ultimate declaration that ensues. And neither, for that matter, uh, does the state of Vietnam, which is also represented at the conference, uh, but not as a, a kind of formal participating member. And this gives the state of Vietnam uh, the opportunity to claim in 1956 that they had never agreed to any of these provisions, um, that they are not legally binding. Uh, the Geneva Conference is a declaration uh, of intent, but it's not a formal legally binding document. Uh, and this really gives both sides an out. Uh, the North Vietnamese, what, what becomes what we call North Vietnam and South Vietnam, uh, a, a pretext not to proceed with the elections that are promised. Um, and it, as everybody knows, Vietnam ends up remaining divided uh, more or less along these lines uh, until 1975. So that's great. That will bring us to the end of our first uh, series of episodes on Vietnam. Um, we'll talk next time about what was South Vietnam and the political constellations that were operating there. So uh, thank you so much, Sean. And we look forward to having you on again soon. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, guys. This is fabulous. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. 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 Thanks.